Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now uh, we look at uh, the second arm of uh, the supply chain ecosystem, which is the delivery services infrastructure. So here, uh, uh, the contents are the. We should understand that the manufacturing, which is uh, uh, the supply chain uh, uh, primary goal, and the services are intertwined. In other words, there are several services which are needed in the manufacturing process. We are going to see that in the next slide, like logistics, like finance, uh, like IT and so on. So we cannot say their manufacturing and services are, are basically independent. They are intertwined, they have to work hand in hand. And with here since it is the delivery services infrastructure, we we'll look at the developments in transportation in recent times and also high performance trade logistics, their features and some other recent trends in logistics and finally conclude this particular uh, section. So here let us look at uh, the manufacturing and services are intertwined in a supply chain. So let us look at the supply chain. This is a manufacturing network which has suppliers, S stands for sourcing. M for manufacturing, D for distribution, and R for uh, and R for retail. And in this, what are the kinds of services that are needed for in this manufacturing? This one, yeah. In the pre-production, you conduct feasibility studies of the particular product. You require finance and venture capitalists. You require a lot of R and D in terms of doing the product design. Uh, you also have uh, the market research for your product. So these are all the very vital services that are needed before you actually start manufacture of this particular particular product. And the second thing that you have while you are doing in the manufacturing, what are the kinds of inputs that you need? The quality control, how do you test whether your components are good? Whether you, they are following the specifications and they are going to be, when you assemble them, they are going to be uh, uh, modular uh, tight products, not loose coupled. And similarly, equipment leasing. Most of the equipment in the manufacturing is highly asset intensive and hence the equipment is leased rather than uh, they are purchased. And also the logistics the MRO, maintenance, repair and operations and the logistics that is involved both in the manufacturing as well as the inbound logistics that is from the suppliers to the manufacturers as well as from the manufacturers to uh, the dealers and so on. So basically they are the services inputs into manufacturing and services inputs into factory operations are there are several. One is accounting, legal services, human resources, transport and communications, software, insurance, finance, real estate, security, cleaning, catering and so on. So there are various kinds of services that are needed in the factory operations in this. And post production services. In other words, after your product is made, what are the services that you need? Advertising, distribution, outbound logistics that is taking this to uh, the product to the dealers, to the retailers and sometimes to the customers. MRO is maintenance repair operations which is basically service logistics. Once the in case of a repair and a product recalls, you have to get the products back to the manufacturer. Customs and trade logistics if you are doing international shipping and client training for the product sometimes you may have to train your clients how to use it, how to use your product. 
So, you can see that uh, there are several services and of course, I did not add here the obvious ones like the information technology and there is the logistics accounting and other kinds of things. So, here you can see that without this the services, the you know, okay, you, this one cannot function. And one thing which we have already seen is the financial supply chain. As the product moves forward from supplier to manufacturer to retailers and customers, I told you the, the money needs to move backward. In other words, from the customer to the retailer to the manufacturer to the supplier. So, you can see that financial supply chain is an important part in this. It provides you the with the a letter of credit, it provides you the, to the credit to the customers to buy the products and it is also uh, uh, provides uh, the, mm, the foreign exchange and other requirements in the global the global uh, scenarios. So, the, the point I am making here is that although you are dealing with a manufacturing supply chain, there are several services which are of vital importance to make the to interconnect this particular supply chains and also there is one thing that is recently becoming very popular is the social networking among all the participants. Well, social networking is again another service that is provided through LinkedIn, Facebook and other kinds of things. So, there are interorganizational networks which are being formed which are more useful in terms of the services and others. Now, if you look at the what are the developments in terms of the transportation, transportation is one of the services in this. So, the delivery infrastructure transforms economies. The internet wireless sensor networks facilitates greater visibility into and control of shipments. Uh, through improved track and trace capabilities and real time coordination. Now, any shipment when it goes across countries like some shipment goes to from China and comes to US, then it goes through several ports, several players and it, it changes several hands and it goes on several trucks and the internet, the, the sensor networks like RFID, the wireless all facilitate the visibility to this. This is called track and trace capabilities. If you have a container shipping, uh, in case of container shipping, if your products are in a container, then you can trace the container and you can trace the ship when, where, where the container is and find out where, when your shipment is going to arrive for your, to your production site. And also, if you are owner of all this, then you can do the real time coordination. So, several innovations in transportation systems have happened from for example, commercial jet aircraft to container shipping. In other words, for example, people like uh, DHL or, uh, or FedEx, they have their own aircraft for transportation of uh, their mails and there are sewage and Panama canals to facilitate the trade, to f trade facilitation. Now, for example, the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal are the big innova biggest innovations in the logistics paths because they saved a lot of uh, 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 distance of uh, shipping uh, uh, while transporting goods. And there is the trade facilitation which is, uh, is very common now in several, uh, several ports where the, 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 the soft infrastructure is created in the ports to basically to uh, uh, to uh, uh, transfer of a facilitate transfer of goods in a faster manner and also in world class supply chains the movement of components final products information and funds are not discrete functions it's not enough if you just transfer your components or the final products it is uh, along with simultaneously you should transfer the information, you should transfer the funds. So, but are governed by single integrated process. You should treat them the transfer of product, goods, information and funds as an integrated product with a goal of 
tight management of deliveries, inventories and costs. So, the delivery infrastructure becomes a final, a, a fundamental, this one that transforms the economies. So, for example, you can see in this particular diagram, there is the, uh, the Suez and Panama canals and here you have the Suez canal. If the Suez canal does not exist, you have to go via Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. Now, if you go via Cape of Good Hope is 1600 kilometers and it is, if you go to uh, via Suez Canal, it is 10,000 kilometers. So, you are saving 6,000 kilometers if, because of the Suez Canal and there is a lot of traffic that goes via Suez Canal. And uh, similarly, if you go through the, uh, uh, the uh, Panama Canal here, otherwise you have to go through South America and it is 21,000 kilometers, whereas it is 8,000 kilometers if you go via the, uh, the uh, Panama Canal. So, you save something like 13,000 kilometers because of the Panama Canal. And the Suez and Panama Canals have altered the global trade. Basically, they have become highly uh, congested canals. And of course, along with uh, these uh, innovations came, there were Somali pirates in the Suez Canal who are trying to track the ships and uh, they basically create a lot of havoc. Uh, in this particular region. So, but still apart from that the Suez and Panama canals have uh, created uh, a lot of traffic and also it, uh, they have altered the global trade in this that is bit particularly between the Panama canal to the US uh, it has created and also the Suez canal both to US and Europe. <coughs> now, if you look at the, uh, the kind of uh, transportation networks that were created in the globally, uh, you can see from uh, Hong Kong uh, to Los Angeles, there are ships sailing direct and you can see from Hong Kong to Houston and other parts of New York uh, in, the, in the United States. And you can see from Hong Kong to, uh, the, uh, to other places here. And similarly, from Singapore via the, the Suez Canal to New York and others. So, you can see how many routes, how many routes have come in this particular thing. So, the logistics trends and the impact of industrial real estate as it is called is is enormous and there are several shipping routes which have come during uh, during the globalization regime in the 90s and the two, year 2000, uh, uh, the first decade of year 2000. So, uh, but this diagram is a nice one showing all the, uh, the routes to the world. So, but what is high performance trade logistics? <coughs> so, the quality and performance of logistics services differ markedly across countries. So, the logistics in India is different from in China is different in the, in the US and different in Africa and the trade competitiveness of these countries is, diff is, is basically depends on the logistics here. These variations in time cost stem from quality and cost of infrastructure service services policies, procedures and institutions. So, here what does the, what does the, uh, the variations in time and cost stem from? In other words, if you are, I mean the idea of trade logistics is if you are selling a container from a place say in India to, to, to the US or from a place in Africa to US or from Singapore to US, what does it cost and how much time does, does it take? So, there are variations in the time, it is not the same. I think it is from some places it can take 30 days, from some other places it can take as low as one week. So, 
These variations in time and cost stem from the quality and cost of the infrastructure services and the policies. Now, we are going to see that the, the, uh, the hard infrastructure is only 25 percent. In other words, the port, the, the kind of infrastructure, the, the, uh, uh, and the equipment they have is only 25 percent. Whereas, 75 percent of this is in policies, procedures and other things. That is how many, now if you want to transport something across a port, there are 100 and something, 150 type of different documents to be signed and authorized before anything can happen. So, this is the average of 150 documents which are need to be signed. For example, in Kazakhstan, it takes 93 days to export a 20 foot full container load, container of cotton apparel, while in Sweden it takes only 6 days. And in Nambia, the cost of trade related transactions for a 20 foot full container load container is including land transport from the ocean vessel to the factory gate amount to slightly more than $3,000, whereas in Sweden it is little more than 500 So, you can see the, both the time and cost differences that occur and that determines the competitiveness, trade competitiveness of a country. So, I, I just want to bring in where the institutions and policies come in into the into when you are talking of global trade. And what are the differences in the logistics performance? Differences in logistics performance are driven by the part, the poor quality of physical infrastructure services such as road, rail, waterways and port services and their interfaces. Interfaces is, so if you have a truckload which is coming uh, from the factory and it has to be loaded onto the ship, now the truck has to go to the to the port and from there it has to unload uh, the, the whatever it has on the truck and then upload onto the ship. So, those are the kinds of interfaces. Do you have services for transferring directly the cranes can it directly transfer from uh, the, the truck to the ship then it is easy. The, but otherwise if it has to put it on the ground and then upload it again take it and so on, then it takes more time and more cost. And most inadequacies often are caused by policy and institutional constraints. Procedural red tape, poor enforcement of contracts and rules of engagement, delays in customs, ports and border crossings, pilferage in transit and restrictive protocols on movement of cargo. Well, these are the differences which cause the logic in the logistics performance. So, you can see that there is what is called hard infrastructure, which is the infrastructure like roads, railways, the port, the cranes and all that and also there are the soft infrastructure which are the infra policy and institutional constraints when goods are crossing countries or sometimes the states. So, but the quality of delivery services has a major bearing on the firm's decisions about country to locate in. In other words, if you are a foreign, this one, and if you want to go into low cost location, China, India, or Philippines, or, or whatever, whatever country, how are you going to make your decision to locate in? And, or if you want to buy some components, where are you going to go to China? to buy it or are you going to India or to buy it or some other country to buy from. And if you want to enter into a consumer market, in other words you have some goods, refrigerators, you want to enter into a consumer market, which country are you going to enter? So, then all this depends on the quality of deliver delivery services. In other words, if you want to the road transport, the, uh, the rail transport, and the shipping and also more importantly the rails regulations of the uh, country where you are going to do it. So, the delivery services are has three components to it. One is the infrastructure, 
second one is the soft policies regulations and third one is companies which are doing the delivery in other words there must be logistics companies which which are efficient who can do their particular delivery so that this, these are the three components that are are needed and high logistic costs and more particularly low levels of service are barriers to trade and foreign direct investment in other words there are countries now which are facing this particular problem where there is the labor low labor productivity and bad infrastructure these are basically cited as the reasons for uh, not entering into not attracting fdi in some of these developing nations countries with higher overall logistics costs are more likely to miss the opportunities of fdi because the the the, the point is everybody is the companies are in in the market to make money so if the uh, if you if you if it costs much more to enter into one country than other and then it has lot of policy hurdles then you know, they may not be able to take the risk of entering those countries into this and countries with efficient logistics infrastructure such as singapore and hong kong were targets of mncs for setting up facilities who have seen in the last uh, few decades that these two places although they are cities not countries they have developed uh, they were they were targets for mncs because they have port infrastructure they have air infrastructure although they are islands and people were able to transfer goods very efficiently and they become transshipment hubs so how do you create a brand logistics service this if you want to create brand logistics services then you have uh, a brand logistics provider then that is resources warehouses fleet of vehicles and containers so these are the resources that are needed to become a brand logistics provider the other one is support of financial institutions for letter of credit foreign exchange and insurance and credits see you should understand that a logistics provider is in the business of transferring goods from one place to the other it is one place is one manufacturer who is a supplier to another manufacturer who is an assembler so they are transferring goods now in the in transferring the goods the goods are highly valuable commodities there so when the uh, the supplier gives it to the logistics provider he has a letter of credit from the manufacturer's bank and so the financial institutions are needed for the otherwise the transport will not take place and also insurance against any of these uh, things that can happen and also they have to get a credit because if you are selling an automobile or anything people take loans to buy this so the financial institutions have to give credits to the customers so without this the logistics support basically uh, disappears skill development centers you know logistics is a commoditized activity it is a uh, it is a routine activity and with easy steps but it requires some skills so people have to develop uh, uh, you know have training centers where the skill Uh, skills can be developed for example the warehouse management the fleet maintained and and so on and educational institutions for research because there are lots of new business models you have to find out the optimal location of warehouses which is an optimization problem for each day you have to do scheduling truck services and maintenance and freight space negotiation and allocation and so on so basically you have to uh, these are all daily problems that uh, the uh, logistics provider faces and these are basically optimization problems and there you should have education institution support for developing the software for all this and of course this is a very important thing since you are dealing with multiple stakeholders you have to have people with connections and also domain knowledge 
there should be talent with uh, the domain knowledge. In other words, what does domain knowledge mean? If you are a logistics provider for auto, if you are a logistics provider for say heavy equipment, transfer of boilers and all that, you should have tremendous amount of domain, domain knowledge uh, in terms of who are the big players, if you want something, how do you, how do you get and I have connections with, with all these particular players. So, a brand logistics provider has to have resources, has to have support of financial institutions, skill development centers and of course, connections with educational institutions and software for various kinds of um, uh, things like uh, warehouse location to truck service maintenance and so on and also above all its management should have talent with the domain knowledge and connections. So, what are some of the recent trends in logistics? Some of the recent trends in logistics are, are uh, uh, very uh, uh, interesting. One is there is the piracy in the seas. <coughs> Uh, for example, I said before that the Suez and Panama canals have been the biggest innovations and they have saved thousands of square, uh, thousands of uh, kilometers of shipping and that has boosted the trade in this. But the pirates have seen these opportunities because it goes via seas. Many of the world's most powerful navies are involved in basically have protecting their ships for example. The oil that goes from various places from Middle East to other places that is Somali pirates basically they, they take the ships, they take the, uh, the people in the ship and the hostages and so on. So, many of the world's most powerful navies like US, EU, India, Malaysia, Indonesia and South Africa, their, their uh, navies actually they follow the ships. This is the thing that uh, this one is, this is like uh, uh, the army is following the ships uh, to protect it from the, the piracy. The Japanese and South Koreans send warships to protect ships carrying cars. It is still cheaper and convenient. Then what people may ask is why then go through uh, the Panama and Suez canals? You can go via the uh, South America or uh, the Africa or the Cape of Good Hope. But still it is still cheaper and convenient to pay higher insurance fees and take risk being attacked by the pirates than incur the extra cost of diverting vessels around the Cape of Good Hope. At least in case of Somali uh, pirates, they find that instead of going via Cape of Good Hope and spend another uh, thousands of kilometers on this, it is better to pay the higher insurance fees because of the risk of piracy, the insurance agents, insurance companies, they charge much more than uh, they need it. So, that is what happens in this particular thing. So, and then the other thing that is happening is the performance based uh, logistics. So, it says never tell people how to do things, tell them what needs to be done and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. But what happens in most of the times in logistics is you say you deliver it at this particular time, you take this kind of truck and deliver it at uh, by evening uh, to that particular factory, you take this particular route and you go via uh, this, this, uh, uh, these cities and so on. But on the other hand, this has the, the disadvantages of this that is supposing you take a company XYZ and it has contracted with ABC 3PL to provide a call center and fulfillment services, right. You have a company XYZ, XYZ has contracted ABC which is a logistics company. Under the transaction based agreement ABC 3PL gets paid more the worse the supply chain performs. How? In other words, it's supposed to the 3PL or the logistics provider is supposed to uh, make the company more profitable, the XYZ more profitable, but it does not happen that way. Supposing XYZ had forecasted too much that it is going to sell a particular product 
then what happens is the 3 PL will make more money by storing the excess inventory. So, since it has forecasted uh, then it will store lot of money in the in the warehouse and once there is storage because it is uh, the storage is priced cost uh, per day basis. So, the, the 3PL will make money and also what happens is uh, if you cannot sell this particular product it will become obsolete and uh, obsolete products have to be destroyed and for destroying the obsolete product it will make money. So, the company XY chat because of the forecasting error has to not only loses the particular product it cannot sell, but it has to pay the 3 PL for A for storing the excess inventory and also for destroying the obsolete product for disposing of the obsolete products and so on. So, but if, if supposing XY chat has forecasted too little that is in turn wants to be careful and it does not want to carry too much inventory or uh, does not want to have the uh, the problem of obsolete products then uh, then ABC gets the charge for expediting. So, you are selling more. So, you have to basically airship or uh, you have to have uh, uh, some other way of getting the product to the customers. So, if ABC products are returned they make even more money. So, basically here is the is a condition where if you have a transaction based agreement you just deliver I will tell you what to do. Then you it may happen that you will pay more money to the logistics. So, nowadays what people are trying to do is performance based logistics that is under performance based contract supplier is to assume a more proactive role in managing the customer supply chain by bridging the supply and demand gap. So, basically it looks at your your shelves of the retailers and it is find out what is selling and it will replace whatever is sold and it will remove once it does not sell for more than 15 days. So, the the logistics provider is basically involved he becomes a partner in the uh, in the whole logistics business. The second thing that is happening is the logistics execution. Now, if you look at logistics, what is logistics? It is basically delivering a product at the right time to the right place to the right customer at the right place at the right time at the right cost. So, you have this execution, it is a, an execution this one that is it is not planning anymore it has you have to deliver the product that means, it is an execution based uh, FIR. So, what will happen if something does not who is going to plan the whole thing and what will happen if some truck fails and it cannot be delivered or what will happen if at a port there is lot of delay what will happen you have to pay some fine somewhere and so on. So, more efficient back office processes and more responsive customer service via BPO and there is one logistics company called Penske and it works with a company called Genpack which is a BPO it has a BPO to work improve the efficiency and customer service. So, Penske is a US based logistics company and Genpack manages the logistics services of Penske. Genpack workers in India uh, and Genpack workers are in India and Mexico and arrange for titles and registrations of the trucks leased by Penske. Now, Penske is a company it does not own all the trucks it may own some, but it does not own all the trucks and it leases the trucks from Toyota, Ford and other places. So, the titles and registrations are all arranged by uh, Janpack workers and they check the customer credit status. Supposing there is an order uh, from a particular customer to transfer say 10 trucks or to transfer a particular material from somewhere in the United States in Minneapolis to some place in Detroit. Then they will check the customer credit status, arrange the necessary permits that is if it is an interstate transport and if they get struck at a way station 
supposing the, the truck gets stuck at a way station for some reason, the truck driver would call the BPO staff. It won't call uh, the original this one who would transmit the necessary documentation to the way station. And if money has to be paid, then the credit card is swiped by the uh, uh, by the BPO staff. And after the trip, drivers log into uh, log would be shipped to a Genpak facility in Mexico, where mileage, tax, toll, and fuel data are all punched into Penske computers and then processed in India. So basically, you can see that there is an outsourcing in addition to uh, the outsourcing of the of the manufacturing logistics to a logistics company logistics company outsources to a bpo to for the execution and this is basically happening uh, in the logistics industry to improve the execution capabilities of this so, to conclude, logistics amount to 10 to 15 percent of ever product produced. It is estimated to be more than US 2 trillion worldwide. And uh, the quality of delivery services have a major bearing on the firm's decisions about the country to locate and also on the country's ability to attract FDY. So, it is very easy, very uh, important that the quality of delivers, delivery services are improved. Hard infrastructure contributes only to 25 percent of logistics productivity and other 75 percent comes in from soft infrastructure such as trade facilitation, ICT based execution and so on. So, we have dealt with some of these uh, issues here and uh, that is the delivery service uh, uh, infrastructure and execution uh, becomes an important part of the supply chain here. Yeah. Actually, now we are going to look at uh, uh, the, uh, the institutions that is another element in the ecosystem and their influence on the, on the supply chain. Now here, uh, what are the influence of the institutions and supply chains? As, as we have seen in earlier lectures in global supply chains, the inter-country entry and exit through the ports and airports need to be managed to minimize lead times and inventory. Well, as we are going to see in the next lecture, the performance of the supply chain is in terms of the cost, lead times, flexibility, uh, quality and so on. So, the lead times are the total times and the when in the global supply chain, the time that is spent at the ports or airports is, is an important measure because it contributes to the lead time and also to the inventory. Inventory means it increases the cost. So, that is one of the issues here. So, what are the important parameters uh, for companies to register superior performance? One is soft infrastructure. Everybody, as I may have been emphasizing in my previous lectures also, everybody talks of hard infrastructure like ports, clearance, warehouses and so on. There is soft infrastructure like trade facilitation and uh, uh, the uh, uh, internet clearances and email, e-retailing. These are all the soft infrastructures which basically improve the productivity and customs duties and clearances, free trade agreements and foreign direct investment restrictions. Uh, of course, the customs duties are what you pay when you import and, and also there is a clearance that is needed uh, at the ports uh, whether you can import that particular item or not and that, that can create time problems and so on. The free trade agreements are between countries, there can be regionals, there can be global and it can be between two countries. So, there is the NAFTA which is a North Indian free trade agreement which is between Canada, United States and Mexico and uh, there is the AFTA which is between the countries in South Asia and there are other agreements between countries like India and Singapore, India and, and Thailand and so on. So, basically this countries, there are free trade agreements of this and there are FDI restrictions which are uh, typically followed. A, a company cannot just enter any country 
and start investing or manufacturing and selling. It has to take the permission of the government. For example, in India, there are restrictions on multi-brand retailing. People can enter for single brand retailing. They can enter uh, to do uh, dealerships, but they cannot do multi-brand retailing in this. So, and this is possible in some industries, in some verticals, it may not be possible in some other countries. It all depends on the country, the local environment and so on, but these are the rules made by the government and they need to be strictly followed. The business friendliness enabling attitude and economic diplomacy or another country, is the, is the country uh, business friendly. In other words, if there are any problems associated with uh, with the company, with the judiciary, the legal processes, are they are they friendly to the foreign countries? And also the enabling attitude. In other words, if you are a foreign, this one, what are the what is the attitude that that the the society has, the government has towards that company? And there is the economic diplomacy is between countries or between company and countries where. The, the people as a part of their, uh, their their foreign diplomacy or the country to country diplomacy the economic diplomacy is is in terms of the foreign investments or uh, or uh, the also the the human resource uh, adjustments between countries in terms of the visas for employment of the people and from one country to the other. There are also other uh, people like labor unions which are becoming important this one they can go on strike or they can demand higher pays. Industry associations of course there are lots of uh, associations automobile associations industry ch industry chambers and other communities which are which are which are important. So, they are important parameters for companies under the institutions. So, favorable institution environment reduces transaction costs. Supposing what is favorable institution environment? Supposing whenever you enter there is a Mm, uh, there is a cost involved in terms of not only taxes but also in terms of checkings. You know, if there is a checking at the border, then it takes time, but also uh, mm, uh, 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 time, but but both the uh, uh, the mid delays in the inventory and so on. So basically. The institution environment which is favorable, it will reduce the cost. If you have unfavorable institutional environment, then to make it favorable, there could be some transaction costs associated in terms of uh, the coordination and all that. So, the institutions play a very global part in global supply chains. So, it is very important one has to take into account in terms of uh, the, this one. So, there is companies, there are people frequent talk of economic integration. What is economic integration? Two countries cooperate so that there are no legal barriers for the circulation of goods, capitals and persons. So, these are basically uh, uh, in a country uh, like United States or in India, there are no legal barriers for circulation of goods and capitals across state and at the same time there are negligible economic and social barriers like transportation costs, intermediation costs and social costs. But when you are crossing countries, these legal barriers as well as economic social barriers were there. So, if you want to economic integration like European Union, then these barriers are taken away and you can have free transport of goods, capital and persons from uh, and at the same time, you can have economic and no, no, not much of economic and social barriers. You know, if you look at um, the the cooperation between countries uh, over the years, uh, there were sixteen FTAs, FTAs, free trade agreements, uh, in nineteen eighty nine, and they have increased to one hundred and seventy one uh, in two thousand nine. So basically, there is a an increase in terms of the agreements uh, which are uh, between between countries. Why are uh, why are these agreements are increasing? That's because you know people realize that there is speciality involved in 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 countries. Suppose if a country has natural resources like oil, 
in the Middle East. Then you do not have oil so you have to import. So you need to basically have an agreement for import of oil between the Middle East and your country. And similarly the story that if you have uh, some human resources that uh, that you have and the other country does not have so there to, to transfer human resources from one country to another then you require the free trade agreements. So, basically the, the issue is no country has everything that is needed for the country's people. So, you have to depend on other countries and now the trend is to depend or to, to cooperate and make the lives of people more enjoyable. So, for that country there are basically free trade agreements. Of course, the big question is which country do you choose? What is the free trade agreement? for what vertical that all depends on the policy and also the study then depends on the, the geography of the country and so on. So, but suffice it to say that there is a uh, uh, definitely a, a move or a trend towards more cooperation among countries within the uh, within the world. So, I, I made this point yesterday when I was talking about uh, the delivery mechanisms is that uh, when you are trading across the borders only 25 percent of time is taken to import and is determined by the hard infrastructure. So, there are there is what is called ha hard infrastructure that is port and terminal handling, there is the inland transport and customs inspection and pre-arrival documents. If you look at this is a World Bank document of 2006, the port and terminal handling it takes 12 percent of time, inland transport is 13 percent. So, total is 25 percent is for the hard infrastructure like uh, the ports, the cranes, the trucks and so on. Whereas, the customs inspection takes 16 percent of the time and pre-arrival documents or takes 59 percent of the time. So, it takes 75 percent of time for the soft infrastructure. This is where if you follow the trade facilitation and also get the pre arrival documents simplify the procedures and the signatures that are number of signatures that are needed for pre arrival documents then you will save a lot of time. And similar is true with the customs and inspection. So, there are there are ways in which you can use modern technologies like sensor networks, RFID tags and all that to basically go to the factory, seal it there when they are loading into the container and once it is electronically sealed you can you need not have to inspect again at the customs and you can load it directly on to the uh, uh, to the ship. So, thus minimizing uh, the uh, the customs inspection times and so on, but uh, still uh, it requires a lot of trust and faith between the companies and the and the country officials uh, to basically reduce the 75 percent. And if you look at the electronic trade documents for example, if you take uh, in the, if the, the business is within the same country. For example, you have a seller uh, and you have a buyer and there is a domestic carrier and it is going from one place to the other and the, the payments for the documents could be just one that is the, 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 the bank could be the same for the both the buyer and seller located in the same country or in the same state and also when, when the truck is moving all that the, the documents that are needed could be a single document. But whereas, if the truck is moving globally then you have an exporter, exporters bank, customs officials, freight forwarder, domestic carriers and then international carrier like shipping and then it has to go to a broker then domestic carriers on the other side bank on the other side, customs on the other side and goes to the importers. So, the on the average about 180 documents are needed for and they have to be transacted between all these people which is which amounts to about 12 to 20 players 
who are involved in all this, which including the exporters, the customs, the banks, the forwarders and the carriers, uh, both the domestic and international and, and the brokers. So, this, this is the kind of thing that basically makes the, the global trade a cumbersome exercise. That is where 75 percent of the time is taken for getting the document clearance rather than moving the materials and so on. So, it becomes very important that one should look at uh, this uh, the trade facilitation and to minimize the documents. Minimizing documents does not mean that you allow them free, but you have to basically streamline the trade processes so that things are done properly as well as simply and efficiently. So, we have efficient global logistics is more than brick and mortar infrastructure. So, 7 percent of the world trade is trade logistics. 7 percent of world trade is logistics cost. That is huge you can see that with this one. Trade logistics costs are important as tariffs. You know people uh, they worry about uh, the tariffs, but the logistics costs also are important. Each day saved is equivalent to 0.5 tariff percent of tariff. Each additional day in transport reduces probability US sources from that country by 1 to 1.5 percent. That is basically a huge this one. Most developing nations expand their hard infrastructure, airports, highways, ports, etc. overlook the other network components such as efficient customs clearance and quality trucking services and so on. So, it, it all becomes that, that the trade logistics has to be made more efficient. So, you have two uh, issues here. One is the balance between brick and mortar facilities and policies and regulations and their enforcement. So, the processing times and reduction on inventory times which these people have. So, do you want to have the more brick and mortar facilities and policies, regulations and their enforcement results in in consistent processing times and reduction of inventory uh, inventory levels and so on. So, it is important to notice that the efficient global uh, logistics is more than brick and mortar infrastructure and the hard and soft infrastructure we are mentioning we need to be taken into account. So, what are the visible uh, barriers to trade? They are basically import quotas a very transparent means of limiting the quantity of product that can be imported into the country. You say you can import uh, 1000 cars in any year or you can import 10,000 cars in any year or, or 1 lakh uh, laptops in any year or something. Some products have tariff rate quotas where if you import say 1000 then they, it is free and 1000 to 10,000 then you have to pay uh, some 10 percent estate duty uh, duty, and if it is more than 10,000 to 20,000 you pay some other uh, duty and so on. Textile, food and steel are some of the products that have quota restrictions. That is because there is the local consumption. Because of the local consumption, if people are given an opportunity, they may want to trade outside. That is because it is more, more advantages or uh, or uh, to, to trade in to from with other countries than, than locally and so on. So, and voluntary export restrictions. What happens is quota on trade is imposed by exporting country at the request of the importing country the government. This is between the countries. Instead of always saying import quotas, you can say I want to import. A country can say I will not, should not import more than 1000 pieces you should not import more than 1000 cars because it will affect the local uh, local companies. So, basically these kind of uh, voluntary export restrictions are, are given in, uh, in industries like cement, steel and so on. Invisible barriers, there are lots of invisible barriers which are not apparent and the countries won't say that, but they are there and that is the government, uh, governments are the largest purchasers of goods and favor only domestic producers. So, all the indirect goods 
purchases like paper, the computers, uh, the office equipment and so on. That is a huge expenditure for the government and they are purchased only from domestic uh, purchases. That is basically uh, you know, an invisible barrier to trade uh, that is they are basically uh, favoring the domestic companies. Local content requirements, product standard standards, import licenses are subjective. You say local content for example is people say country of origin or local content difficult to identify where the products are made when the production process causes several burdens. You say it is made in India, you say it is made in China, it is made in Taiwan and so on, but it has everything has crossed several countries and has crossed the hands of several companies. So, the country of origin is that country where article is, is mined, grown and produced or manufactured. But if the production process took place in different countries, country of origin is where goods underwent substantial transformation. So, then the subjective thing is what is substantial transformation? For one example is jeans were shipped to Mexico and bulked in an oven and returned to USA. Since bulking was done to fix the dye, the court ruled that jeans went through a substantial transformation. So, if dyeing is substantial transformation, so, so it is. So, the country of origin in this particular case of jeans becomes Mexico. So, depending on the country origin, the import duties and others change. So, there are lots of invisible barriers to trade that uh, happens. So, you know, in other words, if you, if you look at what is uh, happening, the governments play a significant role in the functioning of the supply chain. Not only the import duties, not only the voluntary quotas, not only providing the uh, the atmosphere to this one business friendliness atmosphere to the companies to come in and survive. Uh, so, it becomes uh, they play a very significant role in this and they can they can basically play a proactive role in making things simpler and making the business uh, making the environment more business friendly and so on so from liberation to protectionism from low customs duty to quotas from no tax to service tax there are multitude of factors that can influence the company finances now after all one should remember that everybody is uh, is in a business to make money and what happens if the entering a particular country means making losses then no company will enter into that particular country. So, it is both in the interest of the countries and the company that the institutions play a positive role which is which is uh, 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 which benefits both the country as well as the company. So, we have completed this um, uh, the four uh, factors that is the supply chains, the resources, uh, the delivery mechanisms and the institutions and their role in making the in the functioning of the supply chain.